What's shaking cocktail fans? I'm Eric Koslick, host of the Modern Bar Cart podcast, and I'm here to share with you just one small part of a project I've been working on for the past several years, making the ultimate green Bloody Mary. A little strange, I know. But when it comes to Bloody Marys, you can't even start thinking about what spirits to use or flavorings to add until you understand what it takes to grow and process the tomatoes. So join me as I harvest and taste through my latest heirloom varietals and explore their flavor properties. Let's go. Gardening, like art, is an end unto itself. It's a way of being creative that has the distinct benefit of allowing you to consume the literal fruits of your labor. For the past several years, I've been growing tomatoes and super hot chili peppers in a humble urban garden in Washington, DC. And each year, I've learned some valuable lessons about how to optimize for things like higher yields and healthier fruit. I certainly wouldn't call myself an expert tomato grower, but that's okay. It's fun to share the life cycle of a plant with my family, especially when that life cycle involves lots of healthy and delicious meals. What tomato, green tomato, green tomato, green tomato. Green tomato, you gonna hold it for me? Okay. Can you be gentle with it? Hey. Hi, tomato. Hi, tomato. You gotta be gentle. Grape tomato. That's a grape tomato, that's right. I'm gonna grab another one. Oop, would you like another one? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Another tomato. You want another tomato? But for now, let's get back to green Bloody Marys. Last year, I ran a taste test of three different green tomato varieties and put together a simple Instagram reel. Here's what that looked like. All right, everybody, I'm gonna show you how I do research and development in the drink space, this time for a green Bloody Mary. First, let's meet the suspect. We've got unripe beefsteak tomatoes. These are green, but not because they're usually green. Then we've got green zebras. This is an heirloom style of tomato. And finally, We've got a type that I grew in my garden called green grapes. Only got a few of these. First, you got to cut your tomatoes up so that you can start extracting the juice. Then get out your handy food processor. Then you're going to want to put these through several levels of straining. Do a rough strain and then another fine strain if you can. And here we've got the juice. Beautiful and very different each type from the other. Beautiful color as well. Then of course we test the pH. I was curious about this. These are just regular pH test strips. And as you can see, we are sitting somewhere in the 3.5 range. Then finally, to wrap things up, I nose and taste each juice and take tasting notes. This year, I decided to repeat the same process, but with two new varieties that I grew from seed. But before we jump into this new cohort, let's review my notes from last year. You can watch me juice some of this year's samples in the background while I run down the list. When it came to the green, i.e. unripe, beefsteak tomatoes, which I sourced from a restaurant produce vendor, I was struck by their mildness. There were some faint green apple and melon notes on the nose, and on the palate there was a bright citric zing and a tart short finish. I guess this makes sense because the fruit still has some churring left to do, so if the flavors and aromas are faint, well, that's sort of on us. The green zebras, on the other hand, were a different matter, earthy on the nose with notes of carrot, licorice, and angelica, but with more of a classic tomato flavor on the palate with some lemon verbena top notes and a savory mouth-coating finish. You could imagine how something like that might pair well with a gin. 
And finally, when it came to the green grape tomatoes, they were very Italian through and through. Aromas of basil, olive oil, and herbs on the nose with a sweet rustic finish that begged for some hearty bread and a flourish of Parmesan. This was the proof of concept that pushed me to repeat the experiment again this year, dedicating all three of my raised beds to green tomatoes. I grew the green grapes again because they were super yummy, but let's meet the new kids in town. First up, we've got Auntie Anne's Green Giants. These aren't super big because it's the end of the season here, but some of the fruit came out pretty hefty, so they do live up to their name. Next up, we've got Evergreen here on the right, and you might be thinking that these fruits are a bit hard to tell apart. They're both kind of green. But in general, the Evergreens turned a shade of yellow green when ripe, and had a slightly more oblong body shape, whereas the green giants were rounder and sometimes showed the slightest hints of red at the bottom when they ripened. Before the tasting, just like last time, I tested the pH, and we're still sitting right in the 3.5 range. So unless you've got an expensive and sensitive pH tester, it's going to be hard to track the differences across tomato varieties with much precision. When I nosed the juice from the Auntie Anne's Green Giants, I was greeted with a deep, almost basic aroma, kind of a base note with some fruity top notes of persimmon and gooseberry and hints of marjoram and earth. And you often wonder when you nose a spirit, for example, if the same is going to come through on the palate, but boy was this not the case here. The Green Giants were bracingly sour on the palate, warping into bitter and salty. They evoked a healthy salivary response, finishing with notes of cumin, sumac, and other notes you might find in za'atar or other Middle Eastern seasonings. After a quick palate cleanse, it was time to evaluate the evergreens. And if I had to sum up my reaction to the nose, I think the word would simply be, wow. As their name would indicate, I was greeted with sappy, cedar-like notes. I was literally transported in time and space to my grandparents' house, where they'd planted arborvitaes in a bed of cedar mulch. That's what I got, cedar and sap, with hints of smoke. On the palate, this one didn't play any tricks like the Green Giants did. All those sappy notes followed through, but with a gentler acidity and a weaker body than their counterpart all of which had me dreaming of pairing this with Mezcal, Sotol, or Ricea to elevate that green, smoky profile. In the end, here's where we stand. Two years worth of experimenting, five varieties tested, and resounding proof that heirloom tomato varietals, green or otherwise, hold untold potential for creative Bloody Mary mixology. Are they hard to get? Definitely. Are they feasible to implement in a cocktail program? Maybe not right now. But I hope somebody with some serious growing potential gets inspired and looks for ways to bring us these beautiful flavors at a price point that allows the best bartenders in the world to make their flavors sing in the glass. Special thanks to Craig LeHoulier at NC Tomato Man on Instagram for his book, Epic Tomatoes, which I highly recommend for anyone starting out on their tomato journey and for his remote guidance as I've worked my way into my own heirloom tomato craze over the last several years. Uh, If you want to learn more about the Bloody Mary, check out the Breaking Bloody series, which is sort of a recurring segment I do on the Modern Bar Cart podcast. You can subscribe and download that anywhere podcasts are found. So until next time, I hope that this has piqued your interest in tomatoes, gardening, and of course, the Bloody Mary cocktail. And I hope that you drink responsibly and experiment boldly. Cheers.